turns out there's a lot more to this. Let's find out from Philip Kren, developer advocate at Elastic. Philip, are you there? Yes, hi, good evening. Hi, Philip, how are you? Good, good, how are you? Fine, thank you. We just heard uh, our previous speaker was a friend of yours, I believe, Nicholas Frankel. Yeah, Nicola is a good old friend. Um, though, well, I haven't seen him in a while because of all the travel restrictions. Of which course. It would have been fun in person in Spain, but well, not this maybe, year. Maybe next year. Okay, Philip, we're all, we're all ears. We're waiting and ready. Great, let's take it away. And I hope we don't have any deaths or anything like that. Um, it shouldn't be as dangerous as in the shipping industry. So let's kick that off with the slides and see where we can take this. I'm just waiting a second for the slides to come up and then we will start. I see my slides. I'll confirm when we see them, Philip. Okay, we're, we're okay. okay. Go ahead. We're okay? Yep. Perfect. Then, then I'll go ahead. So um, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, I'm a developer advocate at Elastic. So mostly I, I try to show off the, the good stuff that we have. And while my examples will be about Elasticsearch, we apply to any, most particularly data store, but any other containers in general as well. probably something you have heard of it's full text search engine behind Wikipedia widely used on GitHub or Stack Overflow um, that stores the data and keeps it and then we have other components but those are mostly stateless so Kibana to visualize feeds to collect data log stash to parse and enrich but I want to focus mostly on Elasticsearch because that keeps the data and that tends to be the most tricky part in any operation so I quickly want to cover our Docker images and what we consider good and bad practices around state for images, um, or like anything that can contain state. We look at time charts and then at Kubernetes operators, which are very fashionable nowadays. So Docker, um, and by the way, uh, the right logo or mascot for Docker should probably be this one, um, because that is also the size of your average Docker container nowadays. Um, so let's dive into what we have with Docker. Internally at Elastic, we once had that saying, um, it's the world, world's most heavily funded college project um, because it did try to, or it did break some stuff over time and something was not always as straightforward as it could be, um, but it should be better nowadays. So you can totally use Docker to run our software, but for us, it doesn't really matter how you get our software. For, and our saying is pretty much like, it is the new zip format. So previously in the past 10 or 20 years, you used to download your software as a zip, and then you just ran whatever binary you had. Nowadays, you probably just get a container and then you just run the container. So we don't really care about the specific format and we still have many other formats. Do whatever is right for you and what you know and works for you. But, well, containers and operators are very fashionable, so that's why we need to support them, of course, as well, because, like I said, we don't have a strong preference. It's pretty much what do users want to use uh, and get our software up and running. Obviously, a new format brings new issues. So let's see some of those issues. So one of the, the fallacies um, that we have with Docker is that sometimes people stop caring about the user that is running something and file permissions. So in the, the past, we accepted that running a server process as root was a bad idea. With Docker, that idea suddenly came back, I would say. Um, and in this little comic here, you could replace the snake um, with a whale. And Tick. that is pretty much what we're getting and what people are being tempted to, um, to not care about permissions, which does not work for our maintainers because we have pretty strict requirements about the user and the group ID that you have for the process running. So we have expectations there, and if you don't meet them and your data directory doesn't allow reads and writes from that user, you will have problems. Um, we used to get a good amount of GitHub issues because of that. Um, what we especially like when somebody says like, I prefer simple fire and forget Docker containers. And I always imagine that people run their data something like this, where it's like, YOLO, whatever happens to my data happens to my data, which is, fine 
if it's for testing, but not fine for production. And the way we approach this is that we would rather suffer a bit more in development to make it harder to set up and then have a good production setup then have a production outage or lose data in production because then people will come to us and complain a lot. Um, so we would rather avoid that. So in our opinion, we always focus on production. Of course, we try to keep it simple for development as well, but we would try to embrace good, well, tactics or techniques uh, on development already. Which plays into the next quote that I have here is that those who do not understand units are condemned to reinvent it poorly. And the problem here is oftentimes that people were told, well, Docker is just something and you don't need to know anything about file permissions anymore or users. And then unfortunately, it's just not true because you still need to know about them because they play into that. Another fallacy that we see every now and then is latest, which is kind of unfortunate because Docker Hub, where most of us are getting their images or now with the new rate limits, maybe not, we will see. Um, with the latest, um, you would just get whatever is the current image today. And on Docker Hub, if you go to our official Docker images, for example, um, you will see that we have Docker pull, Elasticsearch, and this is basically implicitly latest here. So if you don't specify a version at the end here, it is by default latest. And unfortunately, if you copy this command, it will just fail because we don't have latest because we consider latest a bad practice. Why? Let's assume you stand up a three node cluster today and you will, will get version 7.10. And in half a year or whenever you want to add two more nodes to your cluster. And by then we might have a new major version out. And then you might have suddenly a cluster with 7.10 from today and whatever is the next version that will be out when you add the two nodes because you're using latest. And that might just break your cluster in an unexpected way because you have a version mismatch and maybe something is not compatible anymore and you will be very angry with us. Um, so we try to avoid that and don't have that. So you always need to specify the version of Elasticsearch that you want to run. And unfortunately, this command would then not run. Um, another thing that we run into every now and then is that people want to have some runtime mutation. Um, which comes, I think, pretty much from the world where you just install stuff and then you would just mutate as you went along. Um, so either you provide a shell script when you start the container um, or you provide an environment variable and then something should happen and we support none of those. Because the, the Docker way of stuff would be you do any customization, you build the image, you push the image to whatever registry you're using, and then you pull that final image. But that image is immutable and you never change it. So installing a plugin or whatever else you want to add to your image, you would do that once and have a baked in static image, but you don't do any mutation when you start it up. So for example, if you want to add any plugins, this is a bit Elasticsearch specific, but adding any plugins or any libraries or whatever to your images, you would do that based on the official Docker image that we provide in the version that you want to use. You add your plugins and then you create a new image that you push and then you would always pull that final image. And it couldn't fail because, I don't know, the network connection just failed to download this uh, plugin uh, on one node because that might screw up your entire data. So that's why we don't support this approach. You always need to push the final image and then you just pull the image and take the static final image. The only thing that you should not bake into your images are some things that change more or less frequently or independently of your data store, like TLS certificates or any credentials. Because if your TLS certificate expires, you don't necessarily want to reply, replace the, the, the entire image automatically. You might just want to replace the, the TLS certificate. So this here is a quick example Details are not so important, but this just shows how you would generate the keystore, for example, um, with some credentials in with the Docker images. And this is how you could then mount those from Docker Compose. So something like secrets or certificates, you wouldn't bake into the image, but those you would mount. So you can actually have a different life cycle of those. But packages or anything that is static in the image, you should bake into the image up front. Another thing that is always a big discussion is the base image. So our images for quite a while have been based on CentOS, which makes them not exactly small, but they are pretty common, especially our US user base is very used to any Red Hat based images. So it's kind of like the natural choice for us. Um, the good thing is since all our images are using the same base layer, they are shared. 
So if you run all the components, you will just have the thicker base layer once and the others will reuse it. Um, also, the setup is the same across all our images. You just use YAM to install a package, for example. Also, once you have the JVM like we do, because Elasticsearch is Java, um, your images will not be very small anyway. And while we tried Alpine initially uh, with MuCL, we had some bugs there. And GDPC might be old and ugly, but it's, it's pretty battle tested. So we had very few critical bugs with it just because it has seen so much action already. The main downside of that approach is that our images are, of course, larger than if you had Alpine based images. But again, if you have the base image and then you have the JVM and then you have our software, it will not be a super slim image in the first place. Also, the line of thinking that we have is if you have a stateless image, your application, for example, that you just deploy 20 times a day, potentially you care about the image size a lot there. With our stateful images, like for a production setup, Elasticsearch will probably have 100 gigabyte or a terabyte of data on it. So if that base image is 100 megabytes larger or smaller, will not really make a big difference. Also, you won't deploy Elasticsearch 20 times a day because we don't release that often. We only release a new version. Even if you do every single patch level version, we will only release every couple of weeks. Um, and you won't dynamically deploy all of that all the time because you just have too much data on that anyway. That's why for stateless images, I get the image size problem. But for stateful images, we consider it a bit less of a concern. We do, by the way, now concern uh, or support ARM64 images. So once the new Apple laptops will support Docker, um, you can run native images with ARM on those as well. Um, we will, by the way, also add new images soon for UBI. This is pretty common if you want to be certified to run on, on any Red Hat certified uh, Kubernetes environment, you need those images. So that's why we are going to support those. Also, in the next major version of Elasticsearch, since this is a bit of a breaking change, we will actually switch to CentOS and a slimmed down version, not because of size, that's a secondary concern, but mostly because of security scanners, because the current images have too many dependencies and too many false positives. And that takes up a lot of time to answer questions like, why do you have this package? And my security scanner says, like, this is a security issue. And then we're always like, no, actually, this is not reachable in our code, or actually, no, we, we don't even use this. You cannot access that. It's just a lot of unnecessary explaining. So that's why we will try to trim down the dependencies as much as possible in the future, but not for size, but just security scanners, which can be pretty annoying. Okay, now, Kubernetes, the thing everybody wants to have or use. And when I say that, yes, oftentimes people don't really consider anymore what was the problem I'm trying to solve or what is the question. It's just like, I want to have Kubernetes. Fine. We're happy to support Kubernetes. Um, I assume most of you are kind of familiar with Kubernetes by now. It's a set of configuration that you deploy uh, Kubernetes or you have a configuration that you deploy to Kubernetes, um, which looks something like this. So you have the kubectl that talks to an API server where you configure what you do, that it keeps some state, has some other components in it, and then those little kubelets down here, they will do the actual work for you. What do you get off a lot of in this example? Um, what you get a lot of is YAML. And maybe some of you are not really software engineers, but YAML engineers by now, because what they write most of the day is some form of YAML. Um, yeah, and with that, lots of YAML, you get some interesting problems. Um, I don't know, maybe that somebody knows what goes wrong here if you try to use that port mapping in Docker. Um, if you run that through a linter, something unexpected will happen. And this is actually from the Docker docs because it's kind of a common thing. So we're trying to map port 80 to port 80 and port 20 to port 20. When you run that through a linter, what you will get is the mapping 80 to 80 is fine, but the 20 to 20 mapping is weird why is that because yaml has this weird feature if you have colon and it's lower than 60 it will expect that this to be the base so this here the 20 colon 20 is 20 base 20 rather than base 10 as we would normally expect um, the solution of course is to quote that but this is just one of many tricky things that you might run into with yaml um, so beware for us we use environment variables a lot and have dots in those. 
Kubernetes didn't support that for a long time for no obvious reason, um, though 1.8 has been out for quite a while. So since then, you could, without problem, run our stack or Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. But since I said all the YAML, you probably don't want to start writing all of that from scratch. So you want to have a bit of a nicer way to actually interact with that. And that's where Helm charts come in. Helm charts are like a package manager for Kubernetes. Um, it's called an advanced package manager, advanced or not, I don't know, it's a bit up for discussion, but it does provide support for templates and then you can specify more complex resources. So what is the nice thing about Helm charts is that they build on existing primitives. So you have a stateful set that gives you data and you have the service and you have a deployment. And all of those are still there with Helm charts. It's just a, a nice way to, to wrap them or package them and then you fill a template and then it will do the thing for you. So for example, we have official Helm charts for most of the products that we do provide. They are GA, so you can use them in production and they would be covered by support and everything. And you can just roll out your stack with Helm charts. What that looks like, or before I show you some samples for that, the stateful set is generally the thing that keeps your data. And even if you replace the pod that you have running, the stateful set could be reattached to a new pod. This is especially helpful. Let's assume we have a three node cluster and each node has 500 gigs of data and you want to upgrade to the next version of Elasticsearch. Then you don't want to replace a full image and then have to reload 500 gigs from another node but you want to basically detach the storage and reattach the same storage. So what we do is basically we replace that pod or image of Elasticsearch that we have running there and just reattach the existing data to it, which makes any upgrade process a lot faster. And if you have to pay for data transfer, also a lot cheaper. So if you do a rolling upgrade, you could just replace the nodes one by one, wait until the replace node is coming back up before you go to the next one, but you don't have to transfer a lot of data around. You just reattach the data to one of the new nodes. So that makes an upgrade process a lot simpler. We currently mostly test this on the Google container or Kubernetes engine and do support it officially there, but you can also run it on various other environments and we have samples for those. The the good thing or nice thing about the Helm charts are that they are very unopinionated. So basically they just expose environment variables and you can then mount your TLS certificates and you can configure your secrets just like you did with the Docker images before. There are multiple upgrade strategies that you could follow. So if you want to have or do things in a specific way, you can totally do that. Um, also, if you have lots of services running like Elasticsearch and 20 other services and you want to run them in one specific way, the Helm charts give you kind of a way to run everything the way you want to approach it. Whereas the operator that we will get next to has a different approach in that. Just remember that the Helm charts are pretty unopinionated and let you pick like multiple approaches to do things. So how to run that? Um, you can add the Helm repository, which we provide at helmelastic.co. You update it and then you just install the Elasticsearch Helm charts and you can set the, the image version that you want to run. I would set that to the latest version right now. Then you can just change into that directory of examples. For example, that is in our GitHub repository. I have pulled that here. And then you could, for example, use the default um, setting that we have there and with make, we always provide make files for those. Um, you could just apply that setting. And what you would have in that, for example, um, here um, one that one would work for Minikube, for example, I would say that the heap size for an Elasticsearch node should be 128 megabytes. It should have a pretty strict CPU limit and also the memory limit for the entire pod is pretty small. And then I also create the 100 megabyte um, volume claim. So I have a volume, the stateful set in the background um, of 100 megabytes, which is very small, but will be or would be fine for a demo. Also, I'm setting the affinity here to soft. So if I run it on Minikube on my laptop, it's only a single physical machine. Normally, Kubernetes would try to space or we would try to space out your instances across multiple physical machines. If one crashes, then it doesn't crash the entire cluster. Um, so Elasticsearch cluster in that case, 
Um, if you run on your local laptop, you want to soften that affinity that it actually sets up multiple nodes on one laptop. And that's it. The downside is that hand charts kind of like have a limit because they're really like the package manager. They're like, I want to install three nodes in this version, and then it does that. Or I want to upgrade my three nodes to a five node cluster, and it does that. Or I want to upgrade the version, and then you run that. But to have a more longer lasting monitoring and lifecycle management approach, you need the operator framework. And that is what the operator that we provide has been or is doing. So the idea behind operators are that you extend the Kubernetes interfaces. So you can actually run like in terms of services of a customer application and not just Kubernetes primitives anymore. So for the operator, you can think of Elasticsearch, Kibana and APM rather than thinking in terms of pods and services and secrets and stateful sets. They are still there. They're just somewhere in the, the background, basically. How you do that is you have a custom resource definition where you can define of like what your service should look like. And then you can just fill that out and run your service. One thing that sometimes is confusing, there are two similar concepts here. There is the custom resource definition. There's like the blueprint or the class you're into object oriented programming. And then there is the custom resource. That's the actual instance that you have running or the object in the object oriented world. So don't be confused. The custom resource definition is like the blueprint and the custom resource is then the, the cookie that you have created out of the cookie cutter, for example. Or the CRE is basically the cookie cutter and then you have the cookie coming out of that. So the concrete instance that you're interested in is a custom resource. And the custom resource definition is kind of like what is behind all of that. And what brings the custom resource definition to life is the so-called reconciliation loop. It's basically an infinite loop that continuously runs in the background and always checks what have you configured in your custom resource? What is your current running state? How do I move over the application to that state that you want to have? And it will do upgrades automatically for you. It will create secrets for you. It will generate TLS certificates. A lot of that is fully automated and happens in the background. Um, there used to be a Kubernetes operator from the community, but that has been discontinued about a year ago or so. Oh, sorry, no, by now it's already two years ago. Um, and that's why we started our own operator at around the same time or so. So two years ago, we started our own operator. And this one has like five plus full-time full developers, which is quite a lot. But you should see that as an advantage that we kind of like provide a lot of effort into that. So you don't have to. So the operator is also GA. It supports Elasticsearch, Kibana, all the beats and the APM server. Don't be confused. It's not called operator, but it's called cloud on Kubernetes because it should give you a cloud-like feeling or like result. And we call it ECK Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes, um, but it is an operator. Just don't be confused. If you search for it and you don't find an operator, there is an operator. It might just be called differently. Sometimes this causes confusion, unfortunately. It is put together with Golang. We have KubeBuilder, which talks to the SDK for our APIs. So basically, that thing is talking to the API server of Kubernetes to set stuff up. And we also use Customize to patch together things for very old Kubernetes versions that we still support, but need a bit of a different handling. So that's what we have put together here. So how does that look like in production? So the first thing you do is you install the operator. This is a, its own pod that is continuously running in your cluster and just checks the state of these custom resources here that I am configuring then. And then basically checks what is configured here and what do you have running in your cluster. And if those two don't match, it will try to bring your cluster into the state that you have defined in the custom resources. So it will continuously check, okay, you wanted three nodes, you wanted them with these resources, you wanted them in this version. Is the cluster in that state? If no, it will just bring it to that. So if you apply any change here, for example, rather than having three nodes, you add in the configuration that you want to have five nodes, then that controller will pretty quickly pick up, oh, there is a change, you want five nodes instead of three, and then it will just add two more nodes to your cluster. Say for the version number, 
you upgrade the version number and then, they, then it will just roll forward one node after the other uh, in your cluster and replace the version uh, to upgrade you to that next version or new version, whatever you have configured. The big difference to the hand charts is that the operator is opinionated. So we do have best practices encoded in that and some operational knowledge. So for example, we enforce security. We will always set up users and passwords for you. We will always generate TLS certificates. With the hand charts, you have the option, do you want to use um, TLS certificates and HTTPS connections or not? You don't have to. With the operator, we don't leave you much choice because we think this is the right approach. So this is built in. So in most cases, this is a big advantage. If you want to deviate from our path, it will not be that easy though. Okay. Things that the operator can do, for example, it can scale down. So if you say like, instead of five nodes, I just want to have three anymore, then it would drain the node. So basically it would move off the data of those two nodes. So it picks two nodes, it would move the data off. Once all the data has been drained, it would only then shut down those nodes. Or for example, it knows some tricks of how to make an upgrade procedure quicker or safer, and it would apply those automatically in the background for you. You can still shoot yourself in the foot though. So for example, if you have a single copy of the data and you do a rolling upgrade where you replace one node after the other, if you replace the node with the single copy of your data, that data won't be available until the node joins the cluster. So the upgraded node joins the cluster again. Unfortunately, there's no way around it and the operator won't stop you to do things like that. So there are still things where you can hurt your availability, for example, but only if you set them up in a specific way and don't think about how the operator will actually work with that. Okay, so how to run that? There are two ways actually to get our operator. The first one is you can just kubectl apply or kubecouple apply or whatever you call it. Um, I tried to skip over that discussion today. And then you just pick this all in one operator, which will then run one pod in your cluster. You could check like the logs of the operator itself and then apply some setting. We will look at that setting or setup for a cluster uh, over the next couple of slides. There's another way to install the operator um, and that's actually Helm. So you can use Helm charts to bootstrap the operator. And that was only added in the latest version of the um, operator in 1.3 that we actually provide Helm charts for. Before Helm also had some technical limitations that we wanted to avoid, but a lot of people really wanted this feature to not have to basically run some random script here from the internet and install it, but rather run that through a proper repository. Um, so this is the same repository that you have seen before, but rather than having an elastic search resource, you have an elastic operator resource that you can install now into, I installed it into the elastic system namespace. And I'm actually creating that namespace. So the operator now will run in that elastic system namespace, and then your resources can run in an elastic namespace. <clears throat> you could check the, the logs from your application or from the operator again, and then get all the pods that you have running. And you will see that there will be one pod from the operator that is running. So, what do we have here? This is one of three slides where I actually show you the configuration. This is the configuration we provide to the operator to actually set up our cluster. And this and the next two slides are one configuration file. So what you see here, is that this is not a Kubernetes principle anymore or concept. Now, this is what I meant initially when I said, now you can work with Elastic principles. So we have an Elasticsearch namespace in version one, and then you have a kind Elasticsearch. So now you're just thinking in Elasticsearch terms and not in Kubernetes primitive terms anymore, basically. And then you can say, okay, this thing is called Elasticsearch SAM, but this is how we will reference this later on as well. This is the version, I want to have a single node, I want to have two gigs of memory, and I want to have two gigs of data volume as well. So this would just set this up for you. Then I want to run an APM server with that as well. And I referenced the Elasticsearch sample in the previous slide. So this is how this is connected. So this Elasticsearch ref references the configuration of the previous slide. And again, you see the APM server has its own namespace and its own kind. So we have these um, elastic concepts here. Finally, Kibana is pretty much the same thing. 
both the APM server and Kibana are stateless, all their state is in Elasticsearch. And you just reference the Elasticsearch um, cluster, and then it would set you up one node in that version that you're good to go. So this is all you need to do. And then in the background, the operator would start the Elasticsearch cluster. It would set up the Elastic certificates. It will generate some user and password. It will start up node and APM and connect it to it with the right credentials using HTTP HTTPS certificates. So you don't need to do any of that setup. The operator will do all of that for you. That's also why it has a lot more resources behind it because all of that magic uh, had to be implemented in Go in our case. You could use another language, but Go is the most common one to do that actually. To run that on Minikube, for example, um, or actually this is not running on Minikube, this could run anywhere. Once you have that running, you can run just kubectl get, give me those three resources and it would show you that you have three nodes running there. You could expose, for example, um, Kibana to the outside world to access it. And I said, Elasticsearch is generating users and passwords for you automatically. The last command here that would fetch the user you can use to actually log into Kibana then. We would always generate random uh, passwords. So you need to fetch that from the JSON. This is complicated. So I always copy this command because I can never type it correctly. Um, but this would fetch the right password uh, from the cluster state, which is just a Kubernetes secret in the background, and then you could log into your cluster. Okay, if you want to make any changes, um, just change the YAML file with whatever you want and then apply the change. The operator would pick that up automatically and apply that to your cluster. It is pretty widely supported on various environments and tested. Um, and again, in the background, you have a stateful set so rolling upgrades are pretty easy. I have some more slides um, about it, which might go a bit too deep into that. So I, I just skip over that. Um, word here, there are various operators out there. You can see them on operator hub IO. And well, ours is one of them, but if you want to run any of these data stores or various other th systems, you can go to operator hub, just see what their operators can do, fetch them and then set up your software with that. So that should get you started pretty quickly running data stores, but also many other things on Kubernetes. So to wrap up and also leave some kind time for questions. Um, oftentimes people are saying containers are disrupting the industry and I'm never sure if they mean it in a good way or in a bad way because they have some downtime with Docker or Kubernetes, uh, but that is up for you to decide. The question we get pretty frequently is, can I run Elasticsearch on Docker or Kubernetes? And Yes, you can, but that's not really the right question. The question you should be asking is, should I do that? And that's really up to you. If you run everything on Docker or Kubernetes and know how to operate that, probably you should. If it's the first thing you want to run, maybe don't start with your data stores because any stateful service is probably trickier to run than any stateless application. But it is totally an option. One interesting thing that we have seen is what I call the Kubernetes paradox. Um, that we saw before we had an operator. So when you talk to customers, they would ask like, do you have an operator to run Elasticsearch? And we said, no, we don't. And then said, well, we cannot use your software, sorry. And then you turn the question around and say like, oh, so the majority of your workload is actually running on Kubernetes already. And they're like, oh no, no, we're just testing like 2% of our workload is running on Kubernetes, but it's still a hard requirement to have an operator. So while we must have this operator, it doesn't mean that everybody's actually using it. While we have some large customers and paying customers running on it, it doesn't mean that everybody does it or it would be a requirement. So don't feel bad if you don't use an operator. It can just make your life easier if you want to. Handshots versus operators. I hope it, I made it clear the simpler and less opinionated versus more like the full service environment, but like one specific path to follow. And what the operator is especially good at is the so-called day two operations, so scaling up, upgrading, making sure backups happen. All of these are like, there's a lot of logic baked into the operator to help you with these day two operations. So not just starting the cluster, but also keeping it alive and keeping it in a healthy state. Final point before I wrap up, um, we have a booth, we have a, a, a quiz. If you want to get any swag from us, um, do well in the quiz and we will ship you some swag. Um, 
because swag is normally very popular at physical events and our way is well we have a quiz so the top people can get some swag as well at this one um if you don't get the link it's also on our booth so you can find it there um so if you want swag that's where to go <laughs> that's all from me do we have any questions i think we have like two or three minutes left for questions thank you so much philip we are actually a little bit tight on time but thank you so much very um very well presented talk and i say that as someone who uh, professionally advises people on how to create appealing presentations i thought visually this was very nice and clear uh, and i like the videos and the metaphors so that was great could you could you um perhaps tell us a little briefly because we don't have much time about how you see the future of the container how how will it evolve will it standardize uh, will it change um what are your views on that I think containers have kind of standardized already. So uh, in terms of artifacts, like we support so many artifacts that like you have at MSI and Dev and RPM and the Tarji set, and then you have so many ways to install it. So I think in some way it, it has already standardized um, that you have these different Kubernetes um, versions or flavors then does make it trickier, but I think you often try to wrap it away or we test on all of them and try to wrap it away. So I think it is already standardizing and I would only see more investment into that environment and more of it uh, than less going forward. So I think it is helping in that area. Okay, that's great, Philip. And uh, thank you so much indeed. Um, I'm definitely gonna take a look at that quiz. I want the swag, what is the swag? Come on, don't leave us like this. Is it a, an elastic t-shirt or what? What do I get here? I'm not sure if we have t-shirts right now. I thought it was a backpack and a water bottle and maybe some stickers, um, but I'm, I'm not the right person to, to ship you this swag, so I'm never sure. I, I would know the answer to the quiz questions, um, though we don't want to cheat. Um, okay, well, you send that privately to me, that, that's fine. So, uh, Philip, once that. again, thank you so much. You've got uh, several compliments here on that talk and some more questions, which we don't have time to go into right now, but I encourage uh, attendees, please get your questions directly to Philip. So once again, yeah. thank you so much. Find me on the platform. Thank you. Bye-bye, Philip. Thanks. Thanks.